Welcome to the Backyard Bounty Podcast from HeritageAcresMarket.com, where we talk about all things backyard poultry, beekeeping, gardening, sustainable living, and more. And now, here's your host, Nicole. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Backyard Bounty. Today, I'm joined by Steve Newman with Newman Farms, who's here to help settle the great debate that what is the difference between Easter Eggers and Americanas and Ericanas and what all of this means to chicken people. So, Steve, thank you so much for joining me today. Hi. Happy to be here. Happy to set the record straight to give you a little bit of information. First, a little bit about me. I am on the board of directors for the American Alliance, the American Breed Club. And uh, that, that breed club is headed up by some of the original founders and creators of the breed, uh, Mike Gilbert, John Blim, and others. And uh, so I spend time uh, speaking to them, and I'm in close contact with them about the history and the origin of the breed and uh, some of their historical struggles over the years that they've had in terms of recognition and getting accurate information out. And uh, I feel like I have a pretty good handle on it now. So I'm ready to answer your question. Great. I would say you're definitely the authority in this just from following you. And when I got into chickens as an adult, I had chickens when I was a kid, but the very first chickens that I ever had were actually the ones that I purchased from you. So I've kind of been following your farm and stuff for a while. And I see the information that you put out there and the events that you speak at and the resources that you use. And, you know, there's a ton of misinformation out there and you are definitely a great wealth of information on this topic. So I'm excited to get the information out there. It's very confusing. And uh, and I know that you'll help unconfuse it for us. Right. Okay. So um, you want me to start with the difference between Americanas and Easter Eggers? Yeah, that'd be great. So in order to understand the difference between Americanas and Easter Eggers, first you need to take a step back and you need to examine the concept of what is a breed. Now, this is perhaps one of the 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 origin of most of the misunderstandings that happen surrounding this argument is that people have a vastly different concept of what a breed is based on their level of experience. A master breeder of chickens does not think of a breed as a person who goes and buys chicks at tractor supply and has no experience breeding. So to an amateur or a, um, a layman person, their concept of breed is that it is almost like a species like a thing unto itself, that it exists with all of its attributes contained and that it is a, a thing unto itself that does not need maintenance or improvement and that it, it just exists as a, as a thing, as a species. And that is their concept of the breed. And so when you, when you hear new chicken keepers talk about breeds, they talk about, well, Rhode Island Reds are this. Well, Rhode Island Reds are bred by hundreds of thousands of people and have vastly different genetics based on the individual lines. The, the different lines of birds are almost uniquely different from each other to where they're almost like separate breeds. Each line has different genetics. And so a breed is not something that is the uniform as, as they think. Now, a master breeder understands this because uh, master breeders are, are constantly examining and breeding to the standards, so they understand the, the, the diversity of faults and the uniqueness of birds between lines and what happens when you cross two different lines of a breed that you can get completely unpredictable results because the genetics are so different from one line to another. So that's, that's the way that they perceive it. This concept is also further muddied because, for example, in horses or uh, in dogs, you, you have this concept of purity. Um, you, you have papers, you have pedigrees, you have registries, you have things where they trace the lineage of individual bloodlines, and you can trace back to the heritage, and that's the way that they perceive of a breed is something that is kept separate and something that's kept pure. Whereas with chickens, it is completely different. In chickens, what happens is the governing authority in the United, in uh, North America that decides is the American Poultry Association and the American Bantam Association. And what happens is breed clubs or groups of uh, poultry fanciers lobby to have a breed approved. They write a standard for the breed, carefully listing out all the attributes of the breed. Then they commission an artist to draw a picture 
of the ideal or perfect specimen of that breed that outlines exactly what it's supposed to look like. And then it is admitted to the American standard of perfection or into the American Bantam version. And so what you have is you have a standard that is based on physical appearance, not on bloodlines, not on heritage. And so with chickens, a breed is defined, it's kind of like a pumpkin pie recipe. Try to think of it this way. You can make pumpkin pie with a sugar pumpkin. You can also make pumpkin pie with a butter and butternut squash. If you look at a can of pumpkin pie filling and you look at the ingredient, it says butternut squash. It's not even pumpkin, <laughs> right? And you can use a Hubbard squash and you can use, somebody might use more ginger or so or less or whatever, but it's all pumpkin pie. It's not an apple pie. It's definitively a pumpkin pie. So what the standard is, is it, it, it establishes guidelines. It has to be this, this, and this. But within that, you are free to use the ingredients that you want to create that particular breed. And so you have now, of course, with Americanas, you have eight approved varieties. Uh, they are different colors and they have different genetics. Of course, the, those different varieties were created using different breeds with those colors to create them. So all of the, the, the varieties have slightly different genetics based on the breeds that they initially used to bring those colors over to the breed. So the the, the difference between the, my line of silvers, I have silver Americanas and I have blue Americanas. And while there are some similarities, their behavior is different. Uh, my silvers are a little bit more flighty. My blues are more calm. The faults in different lines are different based on the birds that were used. You'll, you'll, you'll struggle with different problems in the different lines of birds and in different varieties. And again, this can vary from line to line. And so there's a lot of, of significant differences in chickens. There's a tremendous amount of diversity. It is all the same species, um, but what you're seeing when you say a breed is it's a very loose collection of phenotypes or physical appearance that, that make that breed up. And the standard in, is in general is composed of like say 20 or 30 things, points of clarification that make that breed that breed. And so you can go down on the list of those particular points and, you know, a breed that doesn't have one of those things, that doesn't exclude it from being that breed. So say, for example, the, the standard for Americanas, they're supposed to have red bay eyes. Their eyes are supposed to be red. Well, many people have Americanas that have orange eyes. It's not to standard. It's not perfect. It's a, uh, you know, something that's not quite right, but that doesn't exclude them from being Americanas, they're still Americanas, they just have that one particular fault. So now you wanna talk about at what point does a, an Americana become an Easter egger? You have to judge these things based on the standard and based on whether or not they breed true 50% of the time or more. And that was a, a guideline established by the breed founders. What people need to understand is that Americanas were bred up out of Easter eggers. In, uh, in the 1970s, the first Americana was created by Mike Gilbert, and it was a Wheaton Bantam Americana. And that's as of the standard exists today. But he used, he used Easter Eggers to create that particular Americana. He bred them up. He crossed Easter Eggers to other show birds, other breeds. So he created Americanas from Easter Eggers. And so Easter Eggers have existed in the United States since the 1920s, uh, since the first birds were imported from Chile. And so they've, they've been in the United States for a long time. But in the 1970s, there was some effort to standardize these birds. And so the, the founders of the breed established this 50% rule to ensure that the birds are true breeding so that people would be able to clarify and differentiate them from Easter eggers from which they were derived. And so that's why the 50% true breeding rule is there. So now you want to get to the, the back to the, is it a, at what point does an, a, an Americana become an Easter egg? Okay, so I said that you have a bird, it has the wrong color eyes. That doesn't make it an Easter egg. Or, you know, uh, what, what, what about if it has, let's say the, the, the blue color is brown, it's mousy, right? Um, and that's not to standard. The, the, the blue is supposed to have good quality lacing. 
But you know, it's, it's, a, it's a color fault. That does not, that alone does not make the bird not an Americana. It's a fault. It's just that, you know, you're getting gradually to more greater problems. Now, when you get to some of the disqualifications that are spelled out in the standard, for example, the standard disqualifies any birds that have yellow skin. So if you have a, a, a bird that has uh, green legs or yellow legs, then um, you can tell for sure that that bird is not an Americana. It's an Easter egg because that is a clear fault uh, outlined as a disqualification in the standard of perfection. And another one is clean-faced. Uh, Americanas, this is a, it's a dominant gene, the beard and muffs. And so, you know, you can get some clean-faced birds sometimes if you're de dealing with breeding single muff birds. Those, those are disqualifications. And you, you could still technically use them in your breeding program to produce Americanas that are to standard if they're true breeding for everything else. But those birds themselves are not standard Americanas. They're disqualified birds. They're Easter eggers. And so any bird that does not meet the breed standard and, and breed true 50% of the time or more is an Easter egg. And so what you get is you have a lot of hatcheries that sell um, birds that they call Americanas. Uh, I went to Tractor Supply yesterday. There was a little bin said Americanas. I looked in there. There's no Americanas in there. They're, they're sourced from a hatchery. These are birds of mixed descent. They, they're bred for blue laying or green laying eggs. Um, imperfect. Sometimes you get some brown laying duds. And, uh, and these birds, some of, many of them have beards and muffs and peak combs, and they have tails, and they, they have, superficially, they look like Americanas, but if you actually look at the standard and compare uh, to a trained eye, people can easily see the difference. Often, the, the hatcher Easter eggers are different in shape. They have bred, uh, been bred to production birds uh, for increased egg laying. And that is not uh, what the standard Americanas have large, full chests. They're not egg production birds. Um, they are, you know, they're a true dual purpose breed. Uh, the birds should be, have a, a nice thick carcass and have good width. And a lot of the hatchery Easter eggers, they're very thin birds. And they're, they're bred specifically for their egg laying capability. And a lot of them have heritage mixed from other production strains of common hatchery varieties. So kind of simply put, Easter eggers are sort of the reject Americanas? Well, Easter eggers existed before Americanas. And that's something that people need to understand, too, that they were the original blue egg laying bird that was in the United States for, for decades. There was no standard blue egg laying breed in the United States for decades. So they precede both breeds. So I wouldn't necessarily call Easter egg rejects. Now, however, you can produce, you can have two different types of, by the definition that they don't meet the standard for any kind of uh, true breeding or any standard variety. You could take a Buff Orpington and cross it to an Americana and you could make an Easter egg, right? Or you could also take two Americanas. You could take a, a Wheaton colored Americana and you could take a wheat and Americana and a brown red Americana and cross them. And because the colors are a mix and they don't breed true 50% of the time or more, those birds are also Easter egg. Okay. I could also take uh, and breed my blue Americanas and I could get a blue Americana that has significant silver leakage because of some genetic problem. And because he does not meet the standard for a color variety, he would also be regarded as an Easter egg. So there's different kinds, there's different, some are crosses, some are non-standard Americanas that are not true breeding colors, and then others are, I guess you would call them rejects or pulls from Americana breeding programs that don't meet the breed standard. Being a, uh, you know, amateur when it comes to the chicken breeds, I, I always assumed that it was like dogs or horses that you mentioned where, you know, Americanas have always been Americanas and they're just Americanas, not that they were a mix of, you know, everybody can can get to this breed of bird with a different recipe. I think that's really interesting. And obviously I have a very poor understanding of genetics with the ability to to be able to make a bird with using different different birds um, in the background. So I think that's that's really interesting. You have people that have won big poultry shows. 
who have outcrossed their lines to Ostromor. So there are there are Americanas that were crossed to Ostromor within the last five years. You have other master breeders who are winning at big shows with birds that have been outcrossed crossed to Blue Andalusians uh, to bring in superior lacing. And again, all of these pursuits, all of these crossings have been intentional efforts to achieve the standard. The standard is the goal. Whatever you do to get there, it doesn't matter as long as you successfully arrive. And so breeding effort is not determined by what you have. It's determined by where you're going with it. And if you are breeding to the standard and this net is dictating your actions, then anything is fair game as long as you're making progress toward improving those traits. I know that on your Facebook page, you have occasionally posted birds that you had available that had leakage. Can you tell me kind of what that means? Leakage is is just basically color that bleeds through on a solid colored bird. So for example, say you have uh, birds that are black or blue and they're built on the extended black or urchin locus. The black is supposed to the black or blue is supposed to extend across the bird evenly. However, sometimes just through uh, insufficient melanizers or potential other genes that are present, you will get uh, these birds will get some silver or gold color that shines through, and sometimes uh, autosomal red will also leak through in the wings on males and sometimes even females if they're silver based. And so you'll get color, foreign color that comes through, that shines through, that is considered undesirable by the standard. Okay, that makes sense. So what are some of the other common misconceptions that you've found between these breeds? Another a common myth with Americanas, and uh, this is really common on some popular blogs that come up uh, in, the, in the early 2000s that were published by kind of, I would call them pop culture chicken expert mm-hmm. icons, um, these people published, uh, you know, um, articles on the difference between Americana, Easter egg, and Americana. Again, when you're trying to explain the difference between these things, if you don't understand breed standards and how those breed standards guide what is and is not a breed, um, then you're you're dealing with this information from a, a, a conceptual misunderstanding. It's easy to create. So one of the myths out there is Americanas only lay blue eggs. Well, now, again, the standard for Americana is composed of 20 to 30 points, you know, uh, uh, points of distinction in the standard for e- different, depending on the variety. And egg color is only one of them. So Americanas are supposed to lay blue eggs. But genetically, a green egg is still um, the same gene that creates a, a, a green egg. It's just a little bit of uh, extraneous brown pigment that shifts the color of the egg toward green. So, it, you know, yes, blue eggs is the desirable goal, but um, many strains of Americanas, many many varieties and, and lines of birds have birds that lay uh, more greenish than blue. Now, can Americana lay a brown egg? No, that's not correct. Are they supposed to lay white eggs? No, they're supposed to be blue, and blue is also a matter of subjectivity. You know, the, the pigment that goes into creating a blue egg is Billa Verdin. And if you look at the Latin root for the word verde, it's green. So this bile, this substance that is uh, that makes, that turns the eggshell blue throughout, this is not a coating, but it uh, permeates the entire eggshell. This pigment is actually a greenish blue to start with. It's not blue-blue. It's green, okay? And so... There, are, there is an interaction with this color and the, the actual structure of the shell um, and some of the brown pigments that shifts this color more toward the blue end. And so selecting for that is extremely complex. And when, when, when breeders are looking at a breed standard, they're looking at all the points of distinction. And egg color is not something that is judged on at a poultry show. I mean, unless it's an egg show, right? But, um, but the actual birds themselves, when they're being judged, are judged on their physical appearance. And so egg color is often one of the least considerations in a line of birds with serious breeders. As long as the eggs are you know, green or blue, they're going to continue moving forward with more important points 
And then once they get all of the issues with the type and shape down and then the feather color and then, you know, everything is dialed in, then they would work on refining egg color and selecting birds that lay bluer eggs. And feeding off the kind of the egg color topic, I see you comment regularly on um, like the olive eggers. I know that this is kind of a different uh, topic than what we're talking about, but as far as the egg colors, um, that the a lot of the charts that are online on how to achieve an olive agar, uh, those are usually not correct. Right. There's a lot of disinformation spread uh, based on, uh, you know, people have created charts trying to be helpful or either trying to promote their farms or, or you know, doing whatever. People have created visual charts and people find these things circulated online and think they're true. And then they breed and then they, you know, they're disappointed. The egg color inheritance is not like mixing paint. It doesn't work that way. It's a series of dominant recessive genes. Um, you know, there's there's one only one gene that controls uh, blue eggs, and it is dominant. But uh, the 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 genes that control brown eggs, there's you know there's a whole bunch of them. It, it's very complex. There's some recessive. There's pigment inhibitors. You know, it, it is an extremely. There are some that are sex linked. It's, it's a very extremely uh, complex process. It is not at all like mixing paint. And so the people who who uh, have very basic understandings of this, they try to make charts to be helpful to show people what to do. And then these people follow these charts and they end up getting brown eggs or, or selling off. And then they people, especially if they're selling birds, have a responsibility to know what they're producing and so that the customers know what they're going to get. If they're buying back crosses, they're going to be getting a 50% chance of brown eggs, not not they'll, you're going to get all of eggs. And, and, and people also mix up the terminology between F1 and, and, a, and a back cross one. And, and, you know, just again, it's, it's a lack of understanding about what is exactly happening with the color. I created an olive egg group and I, I created a breeding chart to try to clarify uh, some of that and left that in place so that people can find that online and have a better shot of, of not disappointing each other and then also producing fewer coals, I think, in, in, in our hobby, the goal of everybody should try to be produce as few useless birds as possible and, um, and save those lives, birds that don't need to be unnecessarily cold because they're the wrong thing. They're not what people are trying to produce. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I know that that is a common, um, a common issue, especially when you're breeding. Oh, this one's not exactly what I wanted, you know, and then it's very wasteful. <laughs> So what about the difference? We talked about the difference between Easter eggers and Americanas, but what about the difference between Americanas and Araconas? Well, the Araconas, there, there's a common misconception, and this is fairly complex like everything. This breed has so much um, mythology surrounding it um, that it's hard to get the accurate information out there. We have um, people publishing things based on kind of periphery knowledge of something they know a little bit, but they don't know the whole story and, and their misinterpretation and confusion about the event creates disinformation that then gets published and, and carries on as a myth and it becomes, you know, something that ends up on the FAQ for the breed clubs trying to straighten this out. So so back in the 1920s, there are multiple sources in the poultry world that say Araucanas came to the United States in the 1920s. That is not accurate. Araucanas, as the breed exists today, the breed that was approved in 1976 by the American Poultry Association, that breed did not exist in the 1920s. It did not exist. And so the birds that first came, uh, that, that, were, that laid blue eggs, that had the blue egg gene, they originally came from Chile. They were imported into the United States in the 1920s. They were mongrels. The people in Chile who bred chi uh, that, that had chickens, a fowl, like many places, like many developing countries, they had no concept that a chicken was a chicken. And they didn't have any effort to control the breeding or the phenotype, the way they looked. They just, you know, they, they killed the sick ones and let the, the healthy ones breed willy-nilly. And that was their, their, that was their breeding program. And so some of the birds had blue egg genes, some of them didn't. They had all at that point been crossed to other breeds. You know, the, when uh, the first guy who got them in the United States opened up the crate and he saw them, he, you know, immediately recognized that 
There was Dominique blood in one, and there was Red, Rhode Island red blood in another. But these birds were a mess. They were absolute mutts from the start. They were Easter eggs, not Araucanos that came to the United States. And so um, efforts to standardize these birds and, and create standard phenotypes out of, you know, standard looks out of those original birds progressed over decades. And so back in the day, back, back in, the, in the 1970s, uh, all the birds that laid, all the chickens that laid blue eggs or green eggs were called Araucanos, all of them, with tails, beards, muffs, rumpless, tufted, didn't matter what they looked like. If they laid a blue egg, it was an Araucano. That's how that, that was the concept of the greed. The greed concept was attached at that time to the egg color. And so at that time, there were multiple groups of people that were breeding different looking Araucanos. Some were, had uh, groups that were, you know, that were, that were rumpless, that didn't have a tail and that had tufts. And then other groups um, were breeding tailed versions with beards and muffs. And so in the 1970s, Mike Gilbert created the first Americana and, and uh, joined up with Don Cable and they, they formed the Americana Bantam Club and they, they started uh, creating different varieties of Bantams, uh, varieties, different colors, and that involved outcrossing the different breeds to make these, these things with Jerry Segler. And then they had some success getting their birds recognized with the American Bantam Association. Um, so the American Bantam Association in, in the na- 1970s, they recognized both rumpless and tufted Araucanos, and they also recognized the tailed and bearded and muffed Araucanos in the 1970s. Well, the big change came in 1976 when the American Poultry Association unilaterally decided, and without a qualifying meet, they decided, Araucanos, we're going to admit them into the American Poultry Association standard, but only the Rumpless and tufted birds are going to be admitted under that breed name. And so all of a sudden, these people who had been breeding the Americanos, the, the, the birds that would become Americanos, the Araucanos with tails and beards and muffs, all of a sudden, they, they, their, their breed name was taken by something that wasn't theirs. And so in 1979, they took a vote to choose a new name for their breed. And they voted nine to five. Uh, the two choices were Americana and American Arcana. And so they chose Americana. So that is that is where the name originated. It was voted on in 1979, and they decided that. And they moved forward, differentiating themselves as a separate breed from Arcanas. The birds were always different birds. They were derived and standardized from Easter eggs, different Easter eggs. Um, but many histories mistakenly uh, claim that Americanas were derived directly from the tufted and rumpless bird, which is ridiculous because both of those genes are dominant. You couldn't use a standard Arcana to create an Americana. You can't create a tail out of, out of, out of no tail. You know what I mean? So yes, the, those birds were never used in the creation of Americanas. Americanas were derived from East Eggers, from Mongols, and bred up to show stock. The same thing is for the Araucanas, that breed was created. It did not exist um, at any time imported from Chile. It was created in the 1970s. So both birds, both breeds were intentionally created through the efforts of breeders and breed clubs in the 1970s. That's a very complicated history. <laughs> I can see how there can be so many, um, so much confusion out there. The blue egg laying chickens is our commons, right? Well, then the American Poultry Association admitted the rumpless and tufted breed as our commons in, in 76. And all of a sudden, you know, their birds that they were selling really didn't look like Araucanas because the majority of the hatchery birds were not rumpless and tufted. Rumpless and tufted birds were pretty darn rare, even even during the breed development. The ones with tails and beards and muffs were far more common. And so the hatcheries were calling these things Araucanas. And then, you know, and then when the Americana breed was admitted and created, with, and they were the tailed and bearded muff, they're like, 
oh, our Easter egg is much closer to these. Let's call them that. So that's why you have all the hatcheries calling their Easter eggers Americanas. And they have not let up. Even here in 2019, I go to Tractor Supply and there's a bin of Easter eggers. And they spell Americana, even with the correct spelling. Sometimes you see it spelt like uh, A-M-E-R-I-C-A. You know, it's spelled wrong. And they're like, that's their their way to avoid responsibilities by using a different variant of the spelling. But they just don't care. They don't care. They use uh, the same spelling and they sell their Easter eggers as Americanas. And, you know, some of them have disclaimers. These are not standard color birds, but they're not bred to standard at all in terms of type or anything. So they're Easter eggers. So the best way if somebody wanted to get, you know, birds that actually met the standard, I assume the best way to get them would be through a, a specialized breeder and not so much the large scale hatcheries? Correct. And, you know, the thing is, um, I, you know, I'm a member of the American Americana Alliance and joining breed club has a lot of benefits. It's only, uh, I mean, it's $10 a year or $25 for three years to join the Americana Alliance. You get a handbook sent to you that has, um, that has a detailed history of the breed as written from Mike Gilbert in the first person. So there's no misunderstandings. And you can read that, and it's very interesting. It's very, you know, lots of history. You can see the difficulties that the breed went through in the early years to seek recognition. Um, I recently got into a, a dispute with Wikipedia, or he said something about, you know, why are you putting this stuff about the breed clubs in history? Well, the history of the breed is the history of the clubs. Without the clubs, the breed wouldn't exist. Those clubs are responsible for um, creating the breed. A breed is never created by one person. It is always a collaborative effort. It takes a lot of people interested in something and passionate and agreeing to the same thing to create that same thing and then go for, uh, through the, the difficult qualifying process that is established by the American Poultry Association to get that breed qualified is a big challenge. And so get, creating a breed... You know, sometimes I see some amateurs on chicken forums, I'm going to create a new breed. No, you're not. Because creating a new breed is a huge endeavor. Um, and, and you have to not only create something that you like, you have to create something that appeals to a large group of people who are all willing to join membership with the American Poultry Association and then travel all across the United States to a qualifying meet and show birds that all adhere to a standard that you agreed upon. It's a huge, and you have to do it twice. It's a huge process. Yeah, the breed clubs are responsible. And so if you are serious about the breed, then, you know, hitch your wagon to a, a breed club and learn. The, the, the wonderful thing about the American Alliance, the club that I'm in, is that I can message Mike Gilbert. I can talk to him on Facebook. I mean, he's still, he's still accessible to pick his brain. The same thing with John Blend. And they're very helpful to new breeders. And, the people who created this breed and who have bred it for 40 years, they're still alive and they're still helping people and still sharing information. And so it's a wonderful opportunity for people to be to get information directly from the horse's mouth, not to get information from, uh, you know, from various blogs where people are, you know, had chickens two or three years and are writing in, a, in an authoritative way where they don't actually know what they're talking about and they get a lot of the facts wrong or they're conceptual understanding of how breeds work is off. So expanding upon that, I know that you're currently developing the Colombian Americana, correct? Yeah, it's just a project. And, uh, you know, the, the thing about Americanas is they have to be true breeding. And there are other true breeding colors. There's many of them. And uh, I've chosen to create, you know, some Colombian. I love Colombian colored birds. I always have. It's my favorite color. And and I love Americanas. It's my favorite breed, and I would love to have them both combined in one thing. And so I set out to create the color, and it's a long, uh, tedious process with a, a lot of culling. Most of the birds are not correct, and, and uh, even if you get the correct color, you get the wrong type and throwbacks from the parent stock that you used for the outcrosses. And so it, it's, um, it's messy. And a lot of people who create project, project varieties 
quality is really poor comparatively. And you can see the difference. Very few people have nice project varieties that are real, you know, standard in type and, and look great. Um, the effort to, to create a standard variety, once, you know, you set out to do it, very few people are successful. And it's not really rocket science. It's just more a matter of, of being patient and having a lot of time and you know, having a basic understanding of genetics. But mostly it comes down to, you know, persistence and, 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 and raising out a ton of birds and pulling all the ones that aren't correct. And, you know, you have to do that anyway when you're breeding. When you're breeding a project variety, you know, 95% of what you're creating is, is not suitable to advance what you're doing. And so it's a real tricky process. And uh, it gives you a whole new appreciation for the breed founders who created the original eight standard varieties. The extraordinary effort that went into creating those and, and making all the genes line up correct. Um, it's a lot of work. And so I, I, I totally... Uh, respect and admire the original founders and what they did for the breed. And, and uh, I think anybody who's a serious chicken breeder, it's great for them to have a project to just understand um, how truly amazing the individual varieties are and why it's great to keep them separate, uh, keep them separated and to keep them pure uh, to, you know, to not reinvent the wheel and to, to pr preserve all that hard work from the generation before. Um, that people have done on those varieties. Have you found any um, any surprises or anything that you didn't expect when you started this breeding project? Mm, yeah, I got some surprises. I got some clean face birds, and it's supposed to be a dominant gene. So there's obviously some variable expression in breeds and buffs. Uh, that first generation cross, I got some clean face birds, which was really weird, and uh, I didn't understand it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So there's there's a lot of things like that. There's some genes that have variable expression where the genes are there, but the actual outward manifestation of them is not. And so it looks like they don't have those genes, even though they might. But I know there may be inhibitors. There's a lot of things that are not understood uh, in terms of genetics. And you start crossing birds. If you, if you know a little, you'll find plenty more that you don't know. There's always surprises in chickens. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So is there any other um, common misconceptions or facts that, that have gotten muddied that you feel need clarified when it comes to the Easter egg or Americana, Ericana? Um, I think that's a pretty good summary. I think that, you know, like I said, this breed has probably more mythology surrounding it and more erroneous thinking and more published inaccuracies than any other breed. And I think that it was just uh, during that period of time, the the blue egg craze, you know, when, when the Americana was approved, blue eggs were still a big novelty in the United States uh, back in the 80s. And, and so, you know, when that breed came out, it, it was, a, you know, uh, the, the Araucanas and the Americanas, you know, just there was a big craze for the blue egg. And there still is to some degree. Um, the egg color, you get a lot of people that... Uh, come looking for Americanas. I want the Americanas with the real blue, 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 blue eggs. You know, I'm like, well, you know, uh, most of those really blue, blue, blue eggs, those are Photoshopped on, and they only exist in, on the internet. <laughs> in in uh, jazzed up photos that have been saturated for color or whatever. Um, almost all the blues, the real actual blues are, are pastel colors, and many of them shift toward the green turquoise uh, phase. You get some sky blue, and uh, but they're very pale, and they're beautiful, but uh, a lot of the eggs that you see pictures of online are not realistic. And people definitely um, are motivated to saturate pictures, uh, to sell their birds or promote their farm or whatever. And so you get a lot of people that are altering photos and making unrealistic uh, uh, representations of what's out there. And... If you really want a good representation of what's out there for egg colors, go to a, one of the APA's um, egg shows, which they've been holding. Uh, they've, they've started up the egg shows again, and they're real popular. And uh, the, the, the real colorful eggs, the Americana eggs included, are, are often you know heavily represented, and you can see the best of what people have to offer for egg color. 
So if the listeners want to, you know, find more information about you and your breeding projects, where can uh, people find you online? For me, you can you can follow or like uh, Newman Farms on uh, Facebook. So you can look at my birds and my plots there. And then um, if you want more further information about uh, the Americanas, um, I recommend uh, going to Americana.org. That's the Americana Alliance uh, webpage. There's more uh, good information there, including archives, historical archives that are open to the public. You can read all of the old publications, uh, newsletters, and handbooks from the past. And um, you have a bunch of good information there directly from the breed founders. And um, like I said, if you join the club there and uh, join the club, you can support the effort of reading Americanas and get a nice handbook with a color chart printed on the back cover. And um, like I said, that's only fifteen or $10 a year for a print, uh, emailed newsletter or $25 uh, for three years. And uh, so it's a minimal investment to support our breed and, uh, and to get yourself access to some good information. You then have uh, get a login for the web form so you can go on to the web form and, and uh, look at some of the, the the information that's been published there uh, over the years in regards to breeding and exhibiting. Um, you also have, have, once you have a login, you can ask questions yourself there directly and get information from the experts, the real experts, the people who created the breed. Wonderful. That definitely sounds like a valuable resource uh, and a very affordable one as well. Well, Steve, thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us today and kind of dispel some of those myths. And I know I have a much better understanding of the differences between these breeds and um, hopefully the listeners do as well. So I appreciate your time. Thank you very much for having me on. Pleasure. And thank you for listening to Backyard Bounty and we'll see you again next week. Thank you for listening to Backyard Bounty a podcast by heritageacresmarket.com. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. If you have a question you'd like us to answer on the show, please email us at ask at heritageacresmarket.com. Also find us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at Heritage Acres Market. All the links mentioned in this podcast will be included in the description. See you again next week.